Michelle Gately, welcome to the Marketing Study Lab podcast. Hi, it is wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. And this is the first recording, or no, not the first one this year, it's the first recording of uh, 2021. So I suppose, Happy New Year, although this is coming out probably mid-Jan. So <laughs> anyway, let's do that. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year to you too. And I hope you had a lovely uh very quiet Christmas, like I think most people in the UK <laughs> did. But, you know, I'm still going through some clearance mince pies that I found at M&S the other day. So okay. I'm just prolonging the uh, festivities in our house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can I can counteract that with six pence parsnips. So <laughs> there you go. Six P for a bag of parsnips. It's like what a bargain. Mad not, I know. Mad not to. <laughs> anyway, that's enough of that. Um, let's stick with the craziness and go for a random opener. Mm -hmm. no one gets away without having one um and this is because as we'll find out in a minute um what you do for a living I thought I'd, I'd ask this question although when I wrote it I thought yeah it sounds a bit sex sexist doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> but it's hugely not at all um so Michelle how strong is your DIY game and can you put up a level bookshelf well, it depends because if okay. it's a flat pack, then I'm, I'm actually quite good at a flat pack. I really am. Um, we moved in the middle of the first lockdown from an unfurnished, sorry, from a furnished flat to an unfurnished house. And we had to buy a lot of flat pack, um, not from Ikea because their shipping was ridiculous. And it was, um, <laughs> there was a big backlog, but um, Argos to the rescue. Yeah. And I vowed never to uh, get um, as many things with drawers again, because I've discovered putting together flat pack drawers is a nightmare, <laughs> but I can put up a flat pack bookshelf. Um, it is a bit tricky with one person. So you sort of need another person to help. Um, if it was something that I had to make from scratch, then no, absolutely not. <laughs> I would not know what to do with that. I can use the, I can use like a leveler tool mm -hmm. to put up a picture um, with those like sticky hook things <laughs> but we are, we are getting very technical it. here we're getting yeah, very technical I mean, so. sorry I'm very much for like the rules and stuff so if flat packs are allowed then yes I can <laughs> cool yeah I, I like I like a good flat pack although sometimes when you order it online and you don't see it you're not quite sure what you, you're going to get so we, we've ordered like various things as everyone has done this year and some of them have come flat pack and you thought oh come on and then others it's a case of put the put screw this thing here and you're done and it's like why why couldn't everything come like this yeah, yeah. So. exactly yeah <laughs> I don't mind a bit of DIY myself but like leveling things that's like a whole different ball game the amount of screws we've put in walls tried to level it and thought how is this not level like we've measured it we've looked at it you know we've we've factored in the curvature of the earth and all that kind of stuff and it's still not level what is going on it is very very tricky but <laughs> Yeah, no, luckily I, I'm just going to stick to flat packs. <laughs> okay, that's cool. We like a good flat pack. Uh, anyway, moving on, bit of an intro to yourself. What's your story that brings you to this stage in your career and what are you up to right now? So I'm currently living in the UK with my partner. Um, we moved here for a working holiday visa, um, but it has been more work and less holiday thanks to COVID. Um, <laughs> But basically, I worked as a journalist for five years before that. And I, you know, I went straight from high school into studying a Bachelor of Journalism. I was very on this one single track in my career. And it suited me really well at the time. I really genuinely loved my job. Um, but I worked in a regional newsroom and you find that um, there's only so much you can sort of do before they push you into a management role because you can't really, you can't really, um, get promoted in any other way mm. so I was starting to take on more management things and that really impacted my enjoyment of the job I was doing less of what I loved and more stuff that I hated which was you know overseeing people and I really didn't like that um so when we moved I just thought well I'm going to be unemployed anyway so why the hell not try to start some sort of business and that mm. is as far as my idea went <laughs> yeah. um, and I was very 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 lucky that my partner got a job straight away um, with basically like a company close to what he was doing back home so I had that you know buffer and he was like yep go for it just try setting up a business and mm. a few trial and error things um, a few just seeing what happened 
things. Now I have a mentoring business where I help people with the skills and the confidence they need to um, blog and podcast for their business. So um, creating that sort of long-term, long-form content that is strategic in part of their business marketing. But I'm not, you know, I don't come from a marketing background. I very much come from a writing background. Um, so it's been interesting learning all of that stuff as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically where I'm at now. And I really, really love working with people like that one-on-one sort of feeling. Um, and I can sort of tailor what they need to where they're at because mm-hmm. I've had a lot of different people, you know, people who aren't comfortable writing anything at all. Um, and others who are like, have got a blog, but just not sure how to make it work strategically for their business. So yeah, it's been a fun adventure so far. <laughs> Excellent. So, so before, before we move on to some actionable tips, what's the, the name of the company? Um, Oh, that, that makes of... it sound very professional, doesn't oh, it? Oh, well, it does, doesn't it? But that's what we like to do is, is, is sell, <laughs> people that are self-employed. We always like yeah. to say, oh, the name of my company is this. And yes, yeah, so I, I work alone, so it's just me. Yeah, so I... Yeah, yeah, I... I wanted to be like, oh, do I just go with my name? But the reason I've 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 kept what the name of my original blog was, which is the unfinished bookshelf. Love it. Um, and I think for me, I just can't quite let go of that little blogger that started. I started blogging in my university dorm room. I started wow. blogging about books, reviewing books, and I just it sort of sums up me. So, but yeah, saying, oh, that's my company does sound very formal. Oh, I just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 the, the reason I asked that is, is because I, I just love that name. Oh, uh, thank I, you. I, I just think it's, you, know, you could have gone with something standard that has blogging in it or podcasting mm. in it or whatever it is, but I just like the unfinished bookshelf. It just, as any good storyteller does or any good blogger does, you know, it puts that little seed in your mind, that piece of imagination, and you can see that bookshelf and we've all got bookshelves at home. We've all got unread books or unfinished books uh, and all that kind of stuff. So straight away, it's it's drawing you into the fact that oh, I can relate to that because I've got loads of books or if I haven't, <laughs> I've got loads of books that I've read that I want to reread. So there's something that I, I really like it. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Cause yeah, since I moved into more of this content marketing space, I have gone back and forwards on, should I change it? Should I not? Is it, mm. is it professional enough and all this sort of stuff? And I just sort of thought, no, you know what? It's me. And I think people who follow me online as well, sort of hopefully know that that's where I came from. And I do talk about that. And I also have a book podcast um, <laughs> as, a, as a hobby as well. So I'm so glad that you think that I'll definitely be keeping it. <laughs> Brilliant. Superb. Love it. Uh, the, um, a previous guest, um, Esty Rand was on the, the, the podcast a couple of episodes ago, uh, just before Christmas, in fact. And uh, she was saying we went through some of the wasteful marketing elements that people do time and time again. And one of them was um, stick with it with a name or, or or see it the logo and the name as hugely important where it isn't necessarily that important it's more important to you than it is to anybody if you've got a good product or service that'll shine through um, but again going back to that I just like the fact that it, it plants a little seed and everyone can relate to it so yeah keep it <laughs> thank you <laughs> cool right I want to move on to some actionable tips then and you mentioned blogging that's part of what you do and what you offer and what you provide uh, contact details for yourself and your website and all that kind of stuff will be in the show notes obviously um, but the first question before we get into those actionable tips I'd like to ask is you started back in university and I think that was 2012 so what's changed in the past nine years in terms of blogging um, well, I can, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not a marketing professional and I've really only come to blogging as a marketing tool in the last few years. Mm. It was always very much a hobby for me. And I was okay. very much thinking, you know, oh, it doesn't matter if I get no page views because it's just a hobby. Um, but I think for me, it's seeing that prof- for a words person, this is going to sound really bad, but you know, it's my second day back at work at the moment, <laughs> but that professionalization of, um, that online space and the the I guess the rise of influences obviously on on places like Instagram and stuff but within the blogging world as well and I guess I've seen that in terms of people writing books because um with 
my book podcast, Better Words, we will often talk to um, new authors. Sometimes we'll talk to people who've published a couple of books, but, you know, people like Stephanie Yeboa, for example, who, who had her first um, kind of, I would say like essay collection slash memoir published last year. Uh, you know, she very much started in that blogging space and seeing that sort of personal blog become a legitimate way to start your career as a writer, I think has been the biggest change. And people taking you seriously. I was always very embarrassed to say that I had a blog, um, even within, you know, when I was working at a newspaper, it felt a bit embarrassing to say because it felt a little bit like there, there, there's that mummy blogger stereotype that mm. I think is really horrible. But, you know, I felt kind of weird about it. And I also had to explain what it was. I mean, it just, I think it was such a new thing that it wasn't part of our general sort of world. And I mean, to some extent, I don't know how much it is now or whether it's just that the people I surround myself are all in this online space. So they mm. get it. Um, but I do think it's just become a more well-known thing and it's become a more legitimate way to um, turn your personal life to really like showcase your expertise, especially if you're a writer. And then for businesses, obviously, it's become a place to build that expertise, to get found on Google and to sort of interact with your customer in a different way. Because you see even big brands becoming a place for sharing knowledge and sharing tips and advice. And that sort of brings you into the fold of their brand, maybe before mm. you even decide to buy something, um, one of their products, for example. You, you do know marketing, you little liar. <laughs> you, do <know. laughs> you do know it. <laughs> yes, but it's not where I come from. I mean, <laughs> ask me about how to put a newspaper together. I'm probably a bit rusty now, but. <laughs> Love it, right. So what I'd like to do uh, is get into the actionable insights in terms of blogging. So almost literally from the top um, down and, and let's just chat through them. And uh, if you can provide any advice and guidance as if I'm one of your clients in terms of it, basically this is free education for me. That's what I'm trying to get at. But um, yeah, if you can just provide some advice and guidance on these elements, then I think people will really learn what, blogging actually is what a good blog is and, and how to do it um, and the things they should look up, out for. So the first thing, uh, which links nicely to your newspaper background, uh, is the heading. What are we doing here? Is it important? What are we doing? What should we be doing? Yeah, so I actually ran a workshop all about headlines um, wow. last week. And I, I'm sorry, not last week. Gosh, sorry. I'll just do that. <laughs> last year. Yeah, so I actually ran a whole workshop on headlines last year. And it it does at first, you're like, oh, surely the headline headline is not that important. I can just leave it till the end. But it is actually absolutely crucial. I mean, it's basically the one chance you've got to get people to read your stuff. Um, it's what shows up on Google as a clickable result. So you want to make sure that you grab people's attention. Um, you know, as reporters, we were often told that, um, you know, if we're lucky, people will read the first paragraph <laughs> of our work. If we're even luckier, they'll keep reading. But really that headline has to grab people's attention. And I think the biggest mistake I see people doing online is writing what they think is a good headline, which is sort of that classic print newspaper, like funny pun headline mm. that actually taken out of context means nothing and gives away no information. So my first kind of tip would be to have a little look um, and research. And I do have some information about this on my, um, on my blog um, about what it takes to write a good online headline. So if you, there, there are a few different things to be aware of, I guess. I mean, there is a good headline for SEO purposes, mm. which will have your keyword in it. Um, we'll probably have that keyword towards the front um, to allow for scanning and will be a certain length as well. Um, now, just off the top of my head, I think it's about between 60 and 70 characters is what shows up on Google. And you know, for most people using WordPress or Squarespace, you'll be able to see a little preview of that. Mm. Um, but I think what 
people maybe don't know and what I didn't know for a long time is that you can do a different headline on page to what you can do for your SEO. And that one can be a little cleverer. It can have the keyword in a different place. It might convey a different emotion because the people who are seeing their headline that is in Google are searching for a specific answer. But the people who are seeing the headline when they're already on your website are already there. So you can afford to be a little bit more emotive, maybe a little bit more catchy and maybe play on that um, sort of, oh gosh, what's the word? Um, Curiosity gap Mm -hmm. that, you know, intrigues them to click a little bit more. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) It's really interesting that, that, that there is two things going on there, two headlines going on there, dependent on where your audience is in, in the customer journey. And that's absolutely fundamental because you are in a different mindset. And I think that's that's one of the things that I, I preach a lot about is that in marketing, people that don't necessarily understand what decent marketing is, they always think that that one form of comms, that one piece, that one blog is going to do everything. Someone's going to see it, read it, contact you, buy from you off that one thing and it's fundamentally just not true you might get one in a thousand that might do that uh but it's it's just one part of a customer journey and seeing that from the point of view of well if you're on someone's website you you are in a different emotional space seeing it from a different perspective as you would be if you're searching for something not necessarily for your company but for an answer on on a search engine that's that's hugely powerful Yeah, I think the best example of this is actually news websites or Mm. um, sort of online magazines. They do this really, really well. And for the headline workshop, I specifically went through and spent a lot of time Googling things to show how when you type something in like, for example, at home workouts, (laughs) um, obviously very popular keyword this year, um, that will get you a certain search result. But that same story will have a different headline on page. And then just on headlines as well, I would recommend people check out the co-schedule headline analyzer um, because that is a fabulous tool. There's a, a free version and a paid version. I still use the free version and you have to know how to write headlines to have them analyzed. But once you can break it down, it's really helpful in seeing the areas where you can improve your headlines and the areas maybe like maybe it's too long maybe you could use a more powerful word and those suggestions have also helped me um, get better at writing headlines as well because I was I was writing headlines for a very specific local newspaper audience and that obviously is very different to Mm -hmm. you know trying to market it market a business online so you know I'm always learning and growing with that as well. And I think the other thing with headlines is you are going to write a lot of crap ones <laughs> before you get a good one. Um, so I always recommend not leaving it to the last minute, but definitely leaving it till after you've written the full piece um, so that you can accurately represent what you're talking hmm. about. Yeah. And then like do maybe 10 to 15 ideas of headlines. Use that headline analyzer and see where you can make improvements, which one scores the best, and then make a choice from that. As I think everyone is tempted to just slap on a headline at the last minute and be mm. like, it's fine, I'll do, I'll deal with that. I still do that sometimes, but I also have like five years experience writing headlines every day. <laughs> so I'm coming from a different place and I'm not saying it's right, but if if you're really fresh at writing headlines, you need to write a lot of bad ones before you can get to the good ones yeah sure sure okay just moving on from that then let's focus on the main part of any kind of blog uh, which is the the content the body copy the main part of it so what are your your tips here Uh, how should we be developing our main content so I think it can be tempting to try and cram everything in and to answer every single possible question about something. And, you know, some people do this really well. Um, The people who are ranking at the top of Google, like if you're searching something about SEO, you'll get Backlinko and all those people who are literally writing thousands and thousands of words on something, but that's just not possible for most of us. Hmm. And, you know, if we're you know, just uh, running a business ourselves, we're trying to juggle everything, actually work with clients, do some marketing on the side, you know, it is very tricky. Um, I would think if you've got an idea, 
try and narrow down the focus, just go really narrow and really deep on that one idea and think of it a little bit like an essay from high school. Um, You don't want it to sound like an essay, you don't want it to read like an essay, but the idea that you have a main argument and one main point that you want to get across and then you have sections of your blog post in which you're making that argument basically and backing things up. So um, I always start off my blog post by literally writing out the main purpose of this post, what I want people to take away, what's the one thing I want them to remember about this, and then maybe three or four sections as to why they should remember that or what, what proves that point basically. And then I further break down those sections and actually, you know, put in dot points what I'd like to say about that. Is there any evidence I'm bringing to that? Does that does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah of course it does. Yeah, <laughs> which is great. So we've got that that content, and you alluded to the actual layout there, how how it would be mm. structured a little bit. But if if we're looking at this from a long term perspective, and then you get into the tens, the hundreds. And then ideally the thousands if you've been doing it for years. <laughs> yeah. Is the should we be looking for a different layout each time? Should it be structured, templated? Should we follow a formula? Well, I I tend to follow that same formula of like different sections and then I break it down. But you can kind of filter one idea through different ways. So um, if you have this idea, you could look at it as um, you know, it could be a how-to post or it could be a comparison between two, maybe like Squarespace and WordPress, for example, Mm. or it could be like five reasons to use Squarespace or, um, you know, how to do this in Squarespace. You could attack that one point in a couple of different ways. So once you've got a good backlog of articles, you can go through and see what's performing well, Mm. and then sort of look at how you can approach that from a fresh, different angle, um, it obviously it has to be something new and different, mm. but you can take that and just play around with it a bit more because there's always so many different angles that you could take on something. And, you know, maybe that is top five things that you need to know about using Squarespace or, you know, five reasons you shouldn't use Squarespace. There's, mm. there's all these different ways that you could take that on. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's sort of, I, I just, I don't know whether I have any sort of, advice for that specifically because I just sort of go with what feels good and for me Mm. I alternate between podcast episodes and blog posts so where I'm at in my marketing is I will sort of think will that sound better as a podcast or is it something Mm. that should be read okay and sort of does that need the visual element of reading things um so yeah that's sort of how I think but yeah, I guess just starting to look at different styles. I and mean, if, if, if it helps to sit down and list out to yourself the types of blog posts you can do, so like a personal opinion piece, a tutorial, um, a comparison, a review, if you have them in the background, then for every idea you have, you could potentially come up with an angle for each of those things. And then you've multiplied your idea and Mm -hmm. you're just sort of making your life a bit easier rather than trying to reinvent the wheel every single time you sit down to write a blog post. Uh, And that that leads on to another point that I'd like to get your um, ideas on and and that's repurposing. So, So you mentioned there that if you've got, say, a list of things that you could do, so review, comparison, all those kind of things, that can be repurposed. But, and you also mentioned podcasting and blogging as well. Uh, so are we looking to just repurpose on our blog? Can we take that elsewhere? You know, what 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 options have we got for repurposing once we've written, say, a one blog? Yeah, so for each blog post I write, because I've already planned it out in sections, I find it quite easy to then look at those sections and think, you know, for example, my main social media platform is Instagram. So I'll look at that and think, how can I break this up into three or four Instagram posts? So it might be where I tell a personal story. It might be the part where I give tips. I might just do like one of those graphics with some tips on it. Um, You know, I might find a funny meme that relates to something um, that gives me an opinion to talk about in relation to what I've already discussed in the blog. I will 
obviously change the wording. I will write in a bit of a different style, but I might have some of the same ideas coming across. But basically, if you are breaking down your blog post into sections, you can quite easily look at that section and think, how could I write just a post just on that section? So if it's, you know, five reasons to use Squarespace and check out the rest of my review you know, for more details here, that's, that's how I sort of repurpose a blog post for, um, for Instagram. And, you know, at the moment I've been doing a lot of graphics heavy stuff on Instagram, which I know some people are leaning into, some people still prefer the photos and it's absolutely fine, but the graphics are working for me. So I might look at a post and think, yeah, I can pull a quote out of that podcast episode with someone. And, you know, they gave five tips for this. So I'm going to share five tips um, and then in another one, I'm going to share my personal story because I had a guest and, you know, we mainly heard their side of the story. So that's sort of how I start thinking. But again, it's all about taking that one idea and looking at it in different angles. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think being a journalist really helped me see that because you're literally forced into doing that every single day, oh, yeah. <laughs> multiple yeah. times a day. So that is just something that you start to train yourself in. And I, I don't expect everyone to be able to look at something and see all these ideas. It took me so long. Um, but once you do start, I mean, there are, there's, I can't remember where I read it. Um, so it's absolutely not my idea at all, but there was a marketing um, person who suggested, you know, making yourself come up with 10 ideas every day, just to sort of train yourself yeah. to be in that mindset um, where you start looking for ideas everywhere. And it, it's, it's a bit like that with your post, but I would never, I wouldn't recommend just, you know, copying and pasting huge chunks to, to Instagram or whatever. You do have to play around with it a little bit and make sure you're, you know, making it work for that particular audience. But yeah, you can definitely take that idea and turn it into something else. And, you know, for podcast episodes, I've, um, I've, I usually write out a full script um, Mm. and then I can easily turn that into a blog post Mm -hmm. with headings and everything like that. And then from there, turn it into, to some sort of you know, Instagram stuff too, whether that's a quote or, you know, a personal story that relates to something that I'm talking about, things like that. Um, But again, it's just about not reinventing the wheel every single time and thinking I need to post, you know, five different topics. If I have a topic in mind for a blog post, I will sort of theme my Instagram content around that for about a week, just because it means even if I'm not saying at the end of every post, check out my blog post, it just mm. means that I'm continuing that conversation and it makes my life 10 times easier. So do you have any form of content calendar or anything that, that, that allows you to plan ahead? Yeah, so I'm actually terrible at sticking <laughs> to things like this. Um, I think it's the day like it's the newspaper journalist in me that mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I love it. I love a tight deadline. <laughs> um, and I will often plan things out and then I get a bit bored and I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that again. So I have spent all this time planning and I, I've been experimenting with a few things and I have like an Excel spreadsheet of ideas that I could work on just so I've got that all down and mm on on paper somewhere and then I just have I use Asana for most of my tasks and I just use the calendar function and I literally just write you know podcast this week and I give myself a brief topic um, and then blog post the next week and the good thing about that is when I do change my mind which happens frequently I can just drag that topic down (laughs) and sort of move it around so um, sometimes I'll just have it for the for the day that it's happening I'll have like blog and then leave it blank for a while until I know what I want to write about Mm -hmm. um but yeah I'm not great at actually sticking to a big plan like that I just sort of like a vague plan and then when I sit down to write a post and I've decided on the topic that's when I'll plan it all out and sit down on paper and actually write out a structure but I'm I'm terrible at advanced planning and you know what I'm okay with that I always used to feel bad about it but like literally it's what I've been trained to do so I'm not going to feel I'm not going to feel bad about it but I am a last minute person (laughs) I do thrive on that (laughs) one one thing you said there is is that you don't try and reinvent the wheel and uh, as a marketer uh, that's something that I see quite a lot and I think 
a lot of marketers can fall into that trap of thinking that they always have to be unique. They always have to be different. They always have to use new, inventive, creative, different ways. Creativity is hugely important. Don't get me wrong. And what I'm talking about there is more the comms channels and the things that we focus on. And we never give ourselves enough time to master a certain platform or continually utilize that platform and not in reinvent the wheel, just be consistent on it enough that it makes a difference and you become um, more uh, open and, and that people see you more. Uh, so that's one thing that, that was really interesting that you, you mentioned there. It's not reinventing the wheel um, because I think we can fall into that trap. New I mean, I've thing. done it. I've done it too. I mean, yeah. new things come out on Instagram and you're like, oh, I'm going to try this. But I mm -hmm. think something else very interesting that I've sort of learned in the last like two or three months um, since Reels came out on Instagram is to start seeing Instagram as having different channels in itself. So okay. when, because a lot of people that I work with and, and a lot of the business owners I know, Instagram's like our main social media channel. And, you know, you think of that and you're like, oh my God, I have to be on Reels and I have to do a feed post and I have to do stories and I have to do this. But actually, if you break down Instagram into those different mm -hmm. channels, you can then focus on what works really well for you. So for me, I was like, well, graphics are working really well for me. I don't have the energy to do reels. So I'm just going to leave that. And I know that there's growth there, but I just don't, mm. oh, I just don't have the energy for it. Yeah. Um, because like 2020, like just, it's one of those things I was just like, I can't be bothered to do this. Um, but I appreciate that's where a lot of people are finding growth and that's amazing for them. Um, but you know, maybe they're not posting every day on their feed. Mm. So I think splitting up Instagram into its own channels has been game changing for not feeling guilty about not doing enough because like if we think that way we could or we just always have a list of things that we're never getting done yeah yeah it, 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 and again it's doing that stuff consistently and if you put too much on your plate it's really hard to maintain that consistency and 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 then if you can't maintain that consistency you start to reduce the quality to try and keep up with it and then that doesn't help anyone it doesn't help you it doesn't help your own personal brand it doesn't help your company and it doesn't help the audience that you're trying to help either yeah exactly and then it, it ends up being worse for everyone doesn't it because you're just yeah, spreading yeah. yourself too thin and then like personally as well you'll end up feeling really guilty because you're like oh I'm doing so badly at this it's like well yeah because mm. you're trying to do everything all at once so yeah. I think oh yeah I just I really sort of the last few months of 2020 was like no I'm just gonna focus on what I'm really mm. I enjoy and what is working for me and what I'm good at like that's mm -hmm. where I'm going to focus my energies and making that decision felt really freeing as well especially going into a new year and like trying to get everything sort of tidied up you know on my virtual desk and stuff in my mind thinking okay so if I'm just going to focus on you know a blog and a podcast and a newsletter that's fine. I'm cool yeah. with that. Like, that's what my plan for the new year is going to be. And I'm not going to try and jump on every single bandwagon that comes out <laughs> because that's what other business owners are doing. Mm -hmm. And and if you think about it, that content isn't going anywhere. So even if you thought in, in six months to 12 months time, actually that, that, that element on that channel or this different channel has got a lot of people that, that I feel I can really help then you've got a whole bank of content ready to go. So you're not, you're not missing out so much as mastering a different channel before going on to the next one. That's the way yeah. I see it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In, in terms of, of quantity, we spoke about quality there, but in terms of mm -hmm. quantity, is there a, a perfect number that we look to do in terms of, of, of blog output? In terms of like per month, per week, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, I would say at least one a month. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I don't have, I, I will say I'm not a scientist. I don't have <laughs> yeah. any backing for that at all. Yeah. But it's quite a nice number to aim for. You want to be doing it consistent, consistently enough that you're, you know, for SEO purposes, adding to your website regularly mm. and that people can come to expect that. I would say if you're doing a blog post once, once a month to make it maybe one of those bigger, meatier subjects, maybe more of like, a guide um, okay. to something. So it's a little bit bigger and then you can potentially market that or, you know, 
uh, tell people about that and get people looking at that throughout the month until you put a new blog post up. If you're, if you're posting more frequently, say once a week, then, you know, some of those posts can, can be a bit smaller and they don't always have to be this huge chunky. I think if you're leaving it to once a month, then making it really high quality will be better for your audience. And then they can always come to expect a nice high quality post and they can come back to you and they know that you're going to help them in some way. Mm. Um, but I think again, like we were just talking about then, like finding what works for you and then sticking with that schedule that works for you is important yeah. because otherwise if, you, if you're not able to keep up with it, if you're like, I'm going to post every, every week and you post every week for like two months and then you don't post for six months, like that ultimately is going to be worse. So if you, have this burst of creative energy and think, yeah, I'm going to post every week, but actually it's realistic to, for you to post every fortnight, then just schedule some of those posts in advance and try. And I mean, I've been there before. I've, I've been that person being like, I'm going to write all the posts now. <laughs> and then, you know, not for months and months when yeah. I was, when I was just reviewing books, you know, there would be times when I would be reading heaps and posting heaps of reviews. And then I wouldn't read for ages and I wouldn't feel like posting reviews for ages. But I think that just harms you in the end. If you're using it for your business, which I mean, you probably mm -hmm. are, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, I don't, if, if you're doing this, if you're blogging as a hobby, then like do whatever the hell you like, <laughs> but for strategic purposes, I think having yeah. a set schedule is helpful. And I mean, just again, I love a deadline. So for me saying, I'm going to post for me, it's every fortnight mm -hmm. um, because it's, it sort of alternates podcast, blog post, podcast. Um, but Practically, that means updating my website every week because I have the podcast show notes going up. Mm -hmm. So it works out quite well for me. But I would say like once a month at minimum, if, if you can. Okay. Uh, just a, a couple more elements that I just wanted to dive into. The, the first one, we've touched upon it throughout, I think, but it's actually incorporating any type of SEO into what we're writing. Should we be tactical about this? Should we be doing our research or should we... Because... Uh, I cannot remember, similarly to you, I can't remember who said it, but I was listening to a podcast and I've said this multiple times, by the way, but they said that Google used to be stupid. It isn't now. And it, it, it's a really good way to think about it because you could cram it with keywords. Google will know that. You could write something that you don't even consider keywords in it. Google will know that, but if it's worthwhile, they will know that as well. So it's yeah. like, is that should we be tactical? Should we be doing our research or, or not? I think so. I'm, I'm, you know, not, uh, you know, hugely confident with researching keywords. So I would say the sort of the tactical approach that I take is what problem is this solving for the reader? Because mm. when people go to Google, they are looking for a solution to a problem. So if that's where you want them to find you, okay. and again, this comes back to the purpose of your blog post. So if the purpose of your blog post is to connect with your readers and they're already on your blog, then you don't really have to worry about SEO too much um, in, in that sense. But if you're thinking, right, I want to write something that will rank on Google, you can go and get all those keywords and stuff like that. But most importantly, it needs to be answering a question um, and yeah. actually answering, solving a problem for you know, and, and Google is really good with like user intent now as well. So, and I mean, it all goes over my head. It's way too technical for me, but, but basically, yeah, Google is, is so clever now that you also, as you said, you don't need to stuff it full of keywords because when you are writing about something organically, Google picks up on the phrases that are associated with it. I mean, the classic example is like coffee. So if you're talking about brewing and beans and all this sort of stuff, Google understands that you are talking about coffee. Mm. So I think I used to get really worried and think oh, I'm not putting enough keywords in or whatever, but just talking about the subject organically like that will help. Yes, sometimes you may have to word something a little bit different just to add in another mention maybe than you would if you were, you know, writing an email to someone mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and it might, sometimes I look at that and think, oh, from like a journalist perspective, I wouldn't necessarily repeat that, but I know it's going to help in SEO just by having that repeated in the headline or whatever. Mm. Um, so yeah, the main tactic I think should be, what is the purpose for this post? Um, and is this helping people? Like, how is this helping them? 
that's like where I focus my energy on anyway, when I'm, when I'm doing stuff and you don't have to write every blog post for SEO. I mean, some of your blog posts can be, I want to connect with my customers Mm. and, you know, is that, for example, sharing things that, you know, putting a call out on social media for their suggestions of what to do in lockdown, for example, I can't think of a better example today. Um, And then sharing those examples, that's going to strengthen those relationships that you already have with those customers. But if, you know, if you're wanting to get that outreach of new customers finding you through Google, then you're going to want something that they're searching for Mm -hmm. on Google related to your brand. So yeah, that's like, I don't know. I think we can get too obsessed over SEO. Mm. Um, and it's also, I mean, again, I come at this from a journalism point perspective and not a marketing perspective, but I think um, we've got to remember that SEO and what Google is looking for is a good reader experience. So writing in a way that is easy to read, is easy to understand, is easy to scan because that's what we do online that's going to be way more important from my perspective, just in my opinion, than making sure you've got the absolute perfect keyword. Like it's much better to make it a good user experience. And the bonus there is that even if you don't rank on Google, people who are using your website will thank you for that anyway. So it's a win-win. Yeah. And I think if if you're doing it that way, and like you said, there's multiple ways you can look at that, but if you're doing it that way as well, look at the, the, the most uh, the, the number of questions you get, or the, sorry, the most frequent questions that you're asked, write a blog post about that in detail. And then when you get asked that, you can direct people to that post. Exactly. Yeah. That is, I always recommend that for clients as well, especially if they're starting off. Mm. Um, and that can be such a good way to get started because it looks like really professional then too. If you're like, well, I can give you a bit of information now, but actually I wrote this whole post on it as well you're just communicating your expertise even more to these people who have come mm-hmm. to you it's, and it saves you time too because you're not repeating the same thing over and over again. <laughs> so let's flip this. Um, and, and final thing I'd like to get your insights into is what mistakes do you see people doing time and time again? And, and in the back of your mind, you're just going, stop, just, just, just stop, just stop doing that, please. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So related to user experience is, Oh, the way that people write paragraphs, like as if it's a, a, an essay, <laughs> your paragraphs in, that are like, you know, 300 words long, like just please don't. So as journalists, we are taught that every sentence equals a paragraph and you hit enter after every sentence. That's very okay. basic news journalism stuff. And the reason why is because in print journalism, your column inches are so small that any sentence will be squashed up to actually, it will Mm -hmm. read quite long. Mm -hmm. So if you've looked at a newspaper, which I mean, I don't blame you. If you haven't looked at a newspaper for a while, they are going extinct. um, You'll see that, you know, if you took that out of the column, it would actually look quite different. Mm. Now, the thing to remember is that when we are looking online these days, most of us are using our phones which also squash things up. So try having paragraphs, which are like two, three sentences max. And you will see on a mobile device and on a desktop, it just makes things so much more scannable Mm -hmm. for the reader. And an addition to that is also just making sure you break things up with lots of headings. Again, like tell people what's coming, make it easy for them to scan because they will scan and you presenting them with a block of text is not going to make them stay and read it all. Mm. They will immediately leave the page. That's, I mean, that's what I do. And I read so many books, but I cannot be bothered to do that on your website. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. And, and that's your user experience, isn't it? That's knowing and understanding your audience. If you... Uh, produced something that was far more technical, you'd expect to have those reams and reams of, of of text and copy, but you're not producing that technical information for somebody to read it at their leisure. You're producing it because it needs to be detailed and thorough and you can't miss anything else unless m- miss anything out, unless a building will collapse or something like that. You <laughs> yeah. know, it's hugely important. Um, yeah. But from the point of view of what we're talking about, and it depends on your industry, understandably, but from what we're talking about, think about, somebody reading it and and think about who you're writing it for and I, I say that in professional qualifications for assignments as well think of the examiner think yeah. of that poor person that's going to sit there and read a <laughs> hundred assignments 
like make it easy or like put arrows to this part 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 give me marks for this bit you know it's like, <laughs> make it easy absolutely i just want to read out um just get it it's um, I've been reading a book called First You Write a Sentence by Joe Moran, and it's very okay. technical on writing. Um, so it's not, it's not for everyone, but I pulled out something last, I've been taking so many notes, um, but he wrote, a sentence should be a labor to write, not to read. And that is exactly how I feel that, you know, we should be making it easy for the reader to comprehend and understand if it's if it's super easy for us to write, it's actually probably going to be quite difficult to read. And again, I think this is where training as a journalist came in so hmm. handy because, you know, every story we wrote, even if it was the 20th story, we would always be told you have to act like this is someone is going to read this. This is going to be the first time someone reads this story. While you don't have to go into too much detail on a lot of things, it could be as simple as adding a link back to something you discussed previously. Mm. You need to acknowledge it. I mean, you see it even with even with COVID stuff. I mean, that's a perfect example is we all sort of know what's going on. But if you watch the news, they will always explain things. And you think, oh, my God, we know this. We know that this is the third time we're in lockdown or whatever. But you have to act as if it's the first time that someone hmm. will be hearing this information because maybe it will be. Mm. And um, giving that context is always important. And, of course, for SEO purposes, linking back is very helpful as well. Um, so yeah, I think my main thing is just please like make your make your paragraphs shorter, hit enter more often, and break things up with headline like headings within within your copy, and just really try and think about. And it does, like you said, it does depend on your industry mm. and who you expect to be reading it. Just as you know, the the people who read the New York Times. I, writing for that is going to be very different to writing for BuzzFeed and they're both equally valid, but you need to tailor it to your audience. And that's, that's the main thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michelle, it's time to, <laughs> to, to, to wrap this up and finish with some quick fire questions if you're ready. Yes. Yes. Okay. What was the last thing you remember Googling? Uh, <laughs> okay. So I like using GIFs. Um, and making memes for my Instagram now. So it was Joe Lysett gifts because I've discovered how much I love Joe Lysett as a comedian. And I was very disappointed by the lack of Joe Lysett gifts. But um, <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> cool. Like it. Uh, what's the most important thing to know about blogging right now? That no idea is. <sighs> Sorry. I think the most important thing is that there is always room for a new idea mm -hmm. and there is always room for your take on something because yes everything's been done before but you can do it in a new and unique way especially if you're like a solo business owner there's always a new take that you can have on it and a new angle cool why do you love what you do i love being able to see people feeling more confident about their writing and to, you know, achieve things that they didn't think was possible maybe, you know, six months, a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with people who said, you know, I would never have thought of writing anything before and they've just published like a spoken word poem that they've done. Um, that to me is amazing, like that confidence. And then the fact that they say like, you know, I didn't think that I could enjoy this. And now I really like writing. Like, that's just amazing to me. And I I just love that feeling. That Brilliant. just makes me so happy. Cool. Finally, most importantly, if people want to find out more about yourself, what you do and how you can help them, where are you pointing them? Um, to my Instagram at Unfinished Bookshelf, where you can also enjoy a range of um, very niche great British bake-off memes that I've made. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love a good bake-off meme? Yeah. I'm, I look, I'm going to try and get, I, it was something I was posting on Tuesdays for bake-off and I'm just going to try and continue it because I love bake-off. <laughs> it definitely, it was definitely one of the highlights of 2020. I never thought I would love reality TV as much as I did <laughs> in the last few months of 2020, but British Bake Off and Strictly, like the two things that got me through. <laughs>
<laughs> Superb. Right, let's end it there. Uh, Michelle Gately, thank you so, so much for joining me. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much.